Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage moderator Greg Sapphire and our distinguished panel. Okay, is this on? Excellent. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Greg Safier, and I work at the Motion Picture Association here in Washington, D.C. And I just wanted to say at the outset that I'm grateful to APAX for the opportunity to moderate this panel titled Advancing Diversity and Inclusion in Media and Entertainment. And I know it's an important topic. It's one everyone up here on the stage cares about, and everyone I'm sure out there in the audience does as well. Uh, and of course, one of the great things about the US uh, media and entertainment industry is that it's not monolithic. It's composed of a rich tapestry of different companies and organizations and stakeholders who are all creating and innovating and experimenting, uh, trying to tell their stories and ultimately reach their audiences. And in many ways, today's panel is reflective of that because we're lucky to be joined by a really impressive group of panelists representing different aspects of the media industry from broadcasting to journalism to performing uh, to nonprofit advocacy. And I think that this panel really covers the waterfront well in being able to speak about A and NHPI representation in the media industry from a variety of different and unique perspectives. So with that, uh, we'll get started. And I'm going to start by asking everyone to introduce themselves, talk about um, the work that you do and the organizations that you work at and how you're working to advance A and NHPI representation. And uh, Michelle Duke, we have two Michelles on the panel, so I'll be using uh, first and last names when referring to them. Perhaps you could lead us off. All right, sounds good. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Duke, and I serve as the president of NAB's, or the National Association of Broadcasters Leadership Foundation, and I also serve as the chief diversity officer for NAB proper. Um, and we do a number of initiatives um, to advance diversity in the industry in general. And I'll name some of these as we, as we talk a little bit more. But on the Leadership Foundation side, we have a number of initiatives for at the collegiate level. And we also have one that helps to move individuals of color and women into ownership of radio and television stations. Um, and then on the NAB side, I'm very fortunate to be here with my uh, colleague Leslie Pina, who just walked by there. Uh, we work to advance uh, diversity in a number of ways to help stations build out their strategies. So happy to talk more about that as we, as we ask questions today. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm just an actor. Uh, but I am very proud to be on a network, Stars. I'm on a show called BMF on Stars. And um, yay, we got, we got some watchers. I'm, I'm shocked. Um, uh, but uh, it's, uh, STARS has been doing amazing work. Uh, they're working on an initiative called Take the Lead with uh, representatives Maine and Chu, um, helping to get more uh, representation and diversity on the network. Um, and, uh, and I think they're doing a wonderful job of it. On BMF, we have, um, out of all the directors, at least half of them are women and POC, women of color. Um, it's, uh, the network is just filled with people of color and um, people who are underrepresented. And, uh, and I have to say, I'm really proud to be on a network that uh, walks the walk. I'm back. <laughs> I'm M. Wynn. I'm, uh, uh, I'm with ABC News. I'm a multi-platform reporter and correspondent. And you know, when it comes to work, I think it goes down, for me, two different paths, two different avenues. You know, one, I'm doing these stories where I'm working to inform people. I just gather the information, put the information out there so that they can make the decision, whether it's something as small as where they want to live or who they want their partners to be or uh, something as big as the electoral system. And then on the other hand, uh, I'm just making sure I take the voices that maybe people wouldn't normally hear. I mean, you likely would not hear their voice unless they were put on to one of our stories. And just being able to 
uh, accurately portray their voice to make sure that maybe they could be relatable to someone else. Because I think a big part of that is diversity, because diversity creates authenticity. And to be able to get that authentic voice out there, then maybe other people can watch it and say, oh, I can relate to that. And maybe they can learn something from it. And I think specifically with ABC News, I feel as if um, they do a, a pretty good job embracing diversity because I don't have to pitch API stories in the month of May. I can pitch them in January. I can pitch them in February and December. And I feel comfortable doing that. Um, and so that's a big part of, uh, of just being able to have that voice and have seniors who will listen um, so that I can you know, get those stories out there. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Stigihara. I'm the Executive Director of CAPE, which stands for the Coalition of Asian Pacifics and Entertainment. And for the past 30 years, we have been advocating for Asians and Pacific Islanders both behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. We believe that storytelling is a way to bridge human beings and to change the world. And so how we do our work three main pillars. One is through our pathway programs, including our Writers Fellowship, which we have now alumni writing on over 60 shows across every major platform and streamer. And we always believe that writing starts, writing and representation starts on the page. And I just want to name that there is a writer strike that's happening in LA now, it's, or in New York, it's been a, a week in, and so want to be in solidarity with the writers and everything that they're fighting for in terms of a fair contract with, with all of the studios. And then we also have focused on executives, because that's the other side of the Cohen that is very important for our stories to be told. If, if we don't have people who look like us, who believe in our stories, who are buying our stories, then that's not gonna push the needle. And the second pillar is consulting and training. We've trained over a thousand studio executives about our stereotypes and stories that need to be discontinued and other stories that should be told more, like stories of Asian joy and Asian as human beings, not just as sidekicks. And, and then the, the last piece is, of course, promoting any project that gets made, because at the end of the day, this is still a business. And if nobody watches it, does that move the needle? And so at CAPE, we say we're changing representation from the writer's room to the boardroom to your living room. Thank you all. Uh, that was yeah. So that was a really great introduction to yourselves, to your organizations, to all the work that you guys are doing. But of course, as we all know, challenges remain. Uh, and there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to advance representation in the A and NHPI community amongst others. And so perhaps next, you could tell us a little bit about how you view those challenges and those obstacles from your you know, unique vantage points and give us a little insight into what uh, you would identify as um, the largest obstacles and challenges that are remaining. And Kelly, perhaps you could lead us off this time. Oh, um, when I first started in this industry, what, 30, maybe seven years ago, uh, there were no organizations that were helping to advance uh, um, Asian Pacific Islanders. I, it, it was a, a, a very difficult time and, and everybody was just sort of trying to get representation of any sort. Um, uh, and so, of course, I, I took a lot of jobs that I probably shouldn't have because it was the only kind of jobs that were available to actresses like myself um, back in the 80s. Um, however, now that I know better, now that uh, there is more out there being written and more available, uh, we can make smarter choices. We actually have choices. And, um, and, and, and to reiterate, um, you know, the importance of writers. It really starts with the writers. Every, you know, we're, n we're not shooting things from scripts that fall out of the sky. Writers are the ones who create these stories. Writers are the ones who create these characters. Writers are the ones who are the, the, the seed to everything that sprouts out of our industry and the messages that we send to uh, the com not just our community, but to the entire world. And so, yes, it is important that we all stand in solidarity with these writers. And would you like to go next? Um, I think across media in general, not just 
for news or you know ABC, but just across media, I think stereotypes have just continued to persist today. You know, model minority, uh, perpetual foreigner, being invisible, and for Asian women, being subservient, being quieter, and I've never been like that. I feel like none of none of these ladies have been like that. And I, I have uh, I have my family to thank for that. You know, as I was growing up, they accepted how outspoken I was when I was a theater kid <laughs> and doing things like that. Lucky you! <laughs> I still get shushed for being too loud. <laughs> Well, that needs to change. <laughs> um, but these seem to persist, and it's not just those uh, ideals of what they think we are, but you know, even when people haven't met me and they see my last name, it's Nguyen, and it's N-G-U-I-N, and people are like, what is that? How do you say that? Nagaya, I've heard all sorts of things. But you know, it's people perceiving what I'm capable of before they meet me, uh, intellectually, socially. Even you know, a roommate in the past had before she knew I was her roommate. She just saw my name. She's like, "Oh, I'm not going to be able to hang out with her." You know, she probably is from X Y Z. You know, so this persists, and it's it, hopefully it's changing. I think it is changing over the past decade or so, and I think uh, those kinds of influences whether they're good or bad, I mean, you can change that into your own perspective to help build yourself up, to make that a good type of influence. Um, but specifically with ABC News, I think they are addressing challenges in general. You know, we have API correspondents across the nation. Can we do more? Of course, I feel like any organization can have more diversity, more API representation. But specifically with ABC, we have what's called the Race and Culture Unit, which is a group of producers who are on every single, at least one is on every show. We've got Good Morning America, you know, World News Tonight, World News Now, uh, America This Morning, the list goes on. But they have a producer who whose thought process is to approach it correctly, think about how this can be a diverse conversation, make sure they get the right voices to be in those stories, and that's always just a good first start, you know? And we've, I've heard from the president of ABC who says everybody at ABC, the hundreds of people at ABC are a part of the race and culture unit, you know, symbolically making sure that everyone has the chance to speak up if they have to. Um, but I think one of the big challenges that we can try to get across is uh, not having enough of that voice, I mean, specifically for news, we have the API producers, we have the API reporters, but are there enough of them to pitch the stories constantly? So we need those allies. Uh, so shout out to the allies out there. <laughs> but uh, that's probably the, the biggest way that we can try to get over the hurdles is not just us, but our allies as well. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that and the importance of allies. And the, one of the biggest obstacles, especially in our industry, is that the system was not built for us. And it was constantly changed to keep us down. So back in the very early days when Seshu Hayakawa may have been the first sex symbol who happened to be Asian, and then they started the, the things like the Hayes Code and the Morality Code, and we can't have people of different races kissing on screen, and so then Anna Mae Wong can't play Olan in The Good Earth. And so all of these, it just happens throughout the years and builds and builds, and so really that's why it's so important today as we are fighting the systemic challenges of the obstacles, it's really important to have organizations like STARS who are with the Take the Lead, been, and they partnered with us and support our executive fellowship, which I talked about earlier, and we're also incubating some other programs for, for writers and other ways to really push that needle forward. And also at Disney, because they also have worked with us for many years on our writers fellowship, and also shout out to Christine Cadena, who stepped up and said, we want to support CAPE's database. So where we sit in the industry, we touch all of the industry. So writers, executives, directors, agents, managers, you name it. So we built this very large database of talent. And the thing is, talent is universal, access is not. So we know that our communities have incredible talent. And so when we keep hearing like, oh, we don't know where to find them, we know that is just BS, right? And so we've been building this massive database, it's internal, and with the support of Disney and other studio partners, we're gonna be making that public this year. And so really just wanna give a shout out to all the people that are, are here and our allies and our supporters, and they're really together with nonprofits like us, the studio support, on-screen talent, everyone on this panel, it's gonna take everybody to make the change that we wanna see. 
I have a couple of thoughts, yeah. Yes. Um, I did some research, we were out there talking before we came in here, and I wanted to just share a couple of numbers, particularly because um, um, M mentioned that um, you're doing such a great job at ABC. I know that there's probably room for growth, but across the industry, and this is in news, okay, and then I wanna talk to you a little bit about the fact that you should think even broader about our industry. But um, there was a decrease this year in terms of um, the AAPI community from 2.8% of the entire news force to 2.5 in, well, in 2022, not this year. Um, and so just it, this is specifically the television news workforce. So obviously there's still some challenges. Obviously we need to do a better job of recruiting um, representation into our industry. That said, with news directors specifically, and the reason I want to focus on that is because um, Michelle mentioned across the board, it does take the individuals across the board, and as um, Kelly mentioned, with writers, on the news side, it's the news director as well, determining, or the producers, if you will, also determining what's going on air. And having that different perspective is important if you want accurate coverage of a particular community. And so that number increased, actually, last year. Sounds very small, but I think it was 3.2% of the news directors in our industry were AAPI, and now there's 3.6, there's so that's, that's heading in the right direction. But think um, broadly, um, if any of you happen to be interested in this industry, about um, taking a management trajectory. The general managers have even further influence in our industry. Uh, on the radio and television side, there it is. I'm not in the um, entertainment space, but um, on the broadcast um, side, the general managers in management, producers, those are tracks that get you toward making the decisions about what's gonna show up on the air. Thank you very much. So. We've heard a lot about the compelling work that you guys and your organizations are doing. We just talked a little bit about you know, the challenges that still remain and some of the ways that you all and your companies and organizations are addressing them. Looking ahead, what comes next? Right? Um, what are the future possibilities and opportunities that are out there that you're excited about, that your companies or your organizations are excited about? And, and perhaps you could uh, lead us off there. Well, first, I think it's exciting to be up here, <laughs> especially with Kelly. I actually had watched her for a while, and I'm like, wow, this is great. Uh, and, and the two Michelles, of course. Um, so it's just great to be here and push this narrative that we're talking about, because I feel like, I, correct me if I'm wrong, this conversation hasn't been something we always talk about from you know five years ago. This is something kind of newer. We make time to talk about this. Um, and it's just exciting to be able to see my last name that has been mispronounced and <laughs> misspelled countless times, just broadcast us across a, a huge network across the nation to millions of people hearing myself say my name. And not just because it's 40% uh, of, or so, 40% of uh, Vietnamese people in Vietnam have this last name, not just because I'm proud of it, but because I'm proud of my family name. You know, my name comes from a Vietnam War hero um, who, you know, who many years ago um, was picking up people in a med medical helicopter. He was a pilot. And just to be able to say his name on air and to be able to, you know, uplift my own sisters who are bold, strong, you know, independent women and my mom who has sacrificed so much for us to be here. I know you all can relate to that type of story. Um, so just to be able to have that name broadcast is just very exciting. Um, and in terms of, you know, ABC and specifically, uh, again, with the Race and Culture Unit, we have this constant conversation about what's next, what can we do next? And for this month specifically, in just a couple of weeks, I believe, uh, we're having you know an hour-long special with API Heritage Month, who uh, we're going to be sitting down with you know, a number of Hollywood actors uh, to kind of celebrate how Asians and Asian Americans in Hollywood have been successful the past few years. And obviously, everything, everywhere, all at once is, uh, is a huge Oscar sweep. And so that's going to be a really exciting conversation as well. But it's not just the API, a, uh, NHPI community. You know, we have this for other minority communities. We have Hispanic Heritage. We have uh, Black History Month. 
it, this is not just for those months, but you know, these are things we can look forward to. We have uh, Pride Month coming up and those hour-long specials for there as well. So I think we're pushing that conversation forward and making sure here at ABC that we have a space to do that. Um, and it's kind of interesting that Michelle was bringing up just the idea of the percentage of API people on air or behind the scenes, because I remember my very first day at ABC News, I walked into the newsroom and an API producer walked up to me and she walks up, she goes, I need to introduce myself because you're the only Asian correspondent at ABC right now. And we need to have a conversation so we can continue to push these stories because I need your face and I have ideas. Um, that has since changed, which is good. And you know, we have correspondents in LA and New York, and so we're all kind of mingling. We all know each other. So this is kind of a, the beginning of a, a long conversation. And uh, Michelle asks, uh, I know in your role, um, you know, speaking of looking ahead, and we talked a little bit about writing, you know, you, you get to see a lot of scripts before most others do. And so given that kind of unique vantage point and seeing what's kind of perhaps the next emerging story is what, what excites you as we look ahead? I am so excited for the future. And for me, I started working at Cape in 2015, one month after Fresh Off the Boat premiered. So it's a very clear demarcation line in my brain as to how far we've come in eight years. And so when I look at the scripts coming down the pike, uh, I'm really excited to see stories that are more intersectional, stories that are just not the stereotypical stories, because that's really what we need to see more of. And so I was just at South by Southwest in March, and I saw three things that were all excellent and different that made me so excited. So the first is American Born Chinese, which will be on Disney Plus at the end of this month. The second is Joyride, which will, is Lionsgate. It comes out July 7th, and it's basically this raunchy girls trip, all Asian cast, written by Cherry Chiba Prabhat Damrang and Teresa Shao, directed by Adele Lim, who wrote Crazy Rich Asians. It's her directorial debut. Nothing like this exists for our community, and that's coming out. And then the last one is Beef, which came out on Netflix. And again, very, very different from anything that we've ever seen. It's about road rage, about two Asian characters, or two people who happen to be Asian, I should say. And it has been phenomenal. Netflix just released the numbers, 943 million minutes almost a billion minutes streamed the first week of that show. So that just again goes to show that stories that are specific are universal. And so I'm very excited to see our stories getting more of the acknowledgement and just the airtime for that. So I'm really excited and just like Em was saying that we've been having conversations like this, uh, the closed room conversations we have with our consulting partners, with Daria Overby and Stephanie Lambert at STARS. You know, when we talk about what we're planning, when, when they tell me, what else can we do? Because STARS, we're taking the lead. How do we take what we're talking about and X, one exit, like one plus it, and make it even bigger and stronger? And so that conversations like that, I don't think were happening 10 years ago. So it's really exciting. That's great. And then Michelle D. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, so we approach um, all of our DEI efforts in the foundation specifically from a programmatic perspective. And so I'm very excited that we have new initiatives that have come out. We have some traditional initiatives that I'll share, our Media Sales Academy and our Technology Apprenticeship Program. Again, thinking a lot broader about what goes into um, television or any entertainment actually as well. So sales has to happen, that's why you see advertisements on television, that happens on the news side as well. The technology piece, the engineering perspective, or a technologist, we have programs, all of these programs usually tend to be like six month programs that train individuals to operate in entry level positions in these roles with the goal of them kind of growing up in the industry and taking on leadership positions. Um, in our new initiatives right now, we have one in production that's gonna train individuals to be news producers, which is really exciting for us because again, those news producers aren't on the air, but they're making decisions 
Um, and M can share that about, like she said, she had ide ideas, the woman who walked up to you. Um, so those individuals are making decisions every day about what you see on television. And then we have a new initiative that will train students to be um, programmers and writers. So that speaks to what Kelly was talking about earlier. And this is it's new for us. We usually operate on the business side of, of things with, with media, but this is named after a gentleman uh, named Emerson Coleman, who happened to be an African-American man that worked um, in uh, television for many years, determining the types of programs that would be selected. Now, imagine the impact of diversifying that space, those people making those decisions about what you see on the air um, in terms of the television shows. This is, this is a new space for us. And so we start that program next, um, actually next week, I believe, um, with Upfronts in, um, in New York City. And so that's gonna be really exciting for us. Thank you. So for my next question, um, we're here at the APAX Legislative Summit, which brings together um, you know, government leaders from across the country, as well as other stakeholders to have conversations about you know, um, issues that are important uh, here in Washington and elsewhere. And you know, how can we all work together on this issue of promoting uh, AA and NHPI representation? What kind of initiatives can we all collaborate on um, from your viewpoints? And um, perhaps here we can start with Kelly. Uh, that's that's a hard one for me. I mean, I you know as an actor, we have a platform and we can sort of you know inform people of of the difficulties of being an actor, especially a woman of color um, in her fifties. Uh, I was doing some research and apparently only. 2% of actors in the Screen Actors Guild uh, make a living wage. Um, and out of that, men and women sort of uh, work equally uh, a amount of time, you know, uh, until the age of 34. And then there's a gender gap. And uh, by the time a woman is 50, she is making 70% less than men in the industry. And if you're a woman of color, you're making even less than that. So the fact that I'm even here <laughs> working on a series as a lead actor is awesome and um, amazing. And there are so many more examples that, that Michelle was pointing out of actors that are, uh, you know, many more Asian shows that are coming out. Um, I would love to see more even uh, representation of uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. Uh, we've had a few, thank you, thank you. We've had a few, um, you know, we had Moana and we've had a little bit of a, a, a glitch with the representation there in the parade that Disney put on <laughs> where they had a dancer who was supposed to be representing Moana that was not dancing hula, that was dancing something else. Um, but Disney, I think, is, you know, going and uh, is correcting that now with, you know, proper choreography, Hawaiian choreography. So, like, I think that things like being out there in social media, you know, having this platform um, and having people just, you know, having their voices heard uh, by companies like Disney, like, you know, all these networks, uh, really encourage them to, to do more and, and, and have a little bit more equity in this, in this industry. Yeah, thank you for that. And Michelle Sujihara, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit um, about your thoughts on, on how we can all collectively work together on these issues. Sure. In California, I, I want to give a shout out to Evan Lowe and Mike Fong for the California Asian American Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus. We've been talking a lot about things like the tax credit and how do we work together with other ideas that we may have. And so really want to thank them and the entire Legislative Caucus for thinking outside the box, for being open and having that conversation. And I, I want to echo Kelly's comments about the Pacific Islanders because really 
speaking as an East Asian especially, like we have this tendency to not be also inclusive of the, the entire Asian diaspora and the Pacific Islanders. And so, for example, a lot of times we'll, they'll say, can Cape come and join this AAPI panel or conversation? And I'll look at the lineup and it's all East Asian people. And it's like, well, okay, but this is not representative of all of our communities. And here we are saying we're not a monolith. So let's see, can we get more voices here? Even looking around any room that you're in, who's not here? Who, who can we bring in? So to be more specific about that. And so I bring that up because it's because of the government that we even have this AAPI umbrella that we're all lumped in together, but yet we're not being inclusive of all of the communities all of the time. No, thank you for that. And you know, perhaps I'll just take moderator's prerogative for a second. And um, you know, Am mentioned earlier about the fact that you know, ten years ago, a lot of conversations like this weren't happening. And I know with the Motion Picture Association, we spent a lot of time um, putting on programming, bringing stakeholders together, whether from LA, connecting them with um, interested parties here in DC to be able to facilitate those sorts of dialogues and create those sort of connections and relationships which really lead to all sorts of interesting and exciting initiatives and outcomes. So I just want to echo and what you said earlier um, as that in and of itself being a really kind of important um, um, aspect of this ongoing conversation. And so um, we have about 15 minutes left uh, on the timer. I make that 14 minutes and 21 seconds. So why don't, uh, why don't I, I ask each of you to perhaps to give us a, a closing thought if there's one thing that you would want the audience to leave with today and then we can use the remaining time for audience, uh, audience Q&A. So I'll just open that up to anyone if someone wants to grab the baton on a, on a closing comment. Uh, I would just say that um, I would hope that I've broadened, or we've all broadened, um, your perspective on media. And it's not just what you see. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. And um, I'd hope that you'd share that, should you have anyone in your family that happens to be interested in this space, because we need more diversity. and so. A broader perspective on media is what I'd, I'd leave you with. I would encourage anyone who has children who want to become actors or writers or directors to support that. I know oftentimes in the Asian community that is not something that parents support. Uh, you know, p kids who are wanting to get into a job that is not stable, that is not going to help the family, <laughs> that is, you know, outside of their box. I would encourage parents to really support the arts and support kids who are wanting to get into that space because these are the people who change the world, who will help to change the way people see us as minorities and, um, and, and get behind that. Kind of on the same idea, I kind of just have an anecdote. Uh, this was back maybe a decade and a half ago. I remember I was sitting with my mom. She was doing my hair. We were watching the news at night. This is in Houston, Texas. And I thought to myself, I told my mom, I was like, hey, I want to be on there someday. And she was like, well, you know, the reality is there are no Asians on TV. There's no Asians in movies. There's no Asians on shows. And she saw my face and she was like, but you know, whatever you wanna do, I'll support you. And it was really interesting because, you know, my whole family's from Vietnam. They've had this really strong work ethic. My, my sister's a doctor, you know, very typical. My sister's a doctor, blah, blah, blah. And then it was me who wanted to be on TV and be in broadcast and tell stories. But my mom was there and she said, I'll do whatever you need. I'll be there to support you. So big shout out to just the people in your lives who have supported you, whether that's your family or your colleagues or your neighbor or your friends or whoever that might be. Uh, big shout out to them and uh, all of our allies. And I, I'll close, I started by saying that storytelling can change the world and so I'll close by explaining a little bit more about that because what we watch on our screens affects how we think, feel, and act about ourselves as well as about other people. And so really, I wanna encourage everyone to be deliberate about what they're watching and to, to share because now there's so much content to watch. 
it's my job to watch everything. I don't even have time. So I don't know about people who have real jobs, like full other full-time jobs, how they watch everything. So really, the panel right before us talked about the importance of voting. And I would say here, it's also voting with your eyeballs and your dollars, because that really will help push the projects forward. And really just want to reiterate that it's, it's all of us. We all have our sphere of influence, right? So your friends, your family, your followers, like if we all use our voice together, then there's nothing that we can't do. All right. Thank you all very much again. And do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Yes, you, sir. Hi, my name is Joshua Shin. I'm a former Apex Fellow, and I uh, wanted to com make a comment and get your thoughts on the, I guess, surging and rising success of an Asian American entertainment culture. So I think a lot of people in this room, we did not grow up with an Asian American culture. Like you said, there are no Asians on television, but now, um, especially with the success of uh, Anything Ever All at Once and uh, other sitcoms about the Asian American experience, we're have, we're, we become a demographic that's valuable and also marketed at, right? As an Asian American demographic. How do we avoid being treated as a block by the media, by advertisers as we gain success collectively, right? Because again, we aren't a monolith, but marketers really like neat boxes and demographics. So how would you manage, how would you recommend, or what are your thoughts on managing, trying to retain our own individual identities as, I guess, um, we succeed collectively? Thank you. Uh, so I would say what we really need there is disaggregation of data, because when the data is aggregated, then that's why we're treated as the monolith. And um, so really, given our where we are today, right? So look at our, we have the, the widest wage gap. So Indians and Taiwanese over index at $1.21 for every dollar that a white man makes. And then at the bottom, we have Burmese making 54 cents for every dollar. But yet, when we're all lumped together, it's much higher. And so it, it, when you're aggregated, it just masks everything. And so I hear that a lot from marketers. Like, well, we don't really spend money on marketing to the Asian community because you basically follow mainstream like tastes. And but. I think once we have the disaggregated data, and this is where Nielsen really comes in and plays a big role, then we start to see, right? So like, because they would say, oh, Asian Americans have the highest amount of disposable income, and they over-index on things like travel and fashion and entertainment. But then we really just need more information to dig in, down into that and to see what communities are really being reached. And any other questions? I thought I saw some over there. You right there. Hello. Hi, my name is Claire. Um, I'm a student at GW, so here in DC. So there's been a lot of events, and it sucks it's during finals. Um, <laughs> but I'm, sh I'm here. <laughs> I came late because I had a presentation. <laughs> but um, I'm just going to provide some context of my education in high school to then ask the, my question. But I went to a performing arts middle and high school. Um, so it was predominantly a third Southeast Asian, a third black, a third white. So these conversations is interesting about like media and like how we perceive media and representation. Because um, starting in the sixth grade, we kind of had conversations about representation and separating artists from the art. And a lot of conversations that I've been seeing has kind of been Gen Z critiquing a lot of millennial generations and older. And I've seen a lot of pushback from the older generation, from younger generations critiquing this kind of visibility. And I want to ask especially, like, how have you dealt with that critique? Um, when, and how, what kind of dialogues do you want to see happen to progress these kind of conversations? Because I'm having a really hard time, even with older Gen Z, where they're only a year or two older, but they really resonate with a lot of millennial culture, that there seems to be a huge disconnect with the understanding of visibility. Everybody seems to be looking at me, so I guess I'll take this. 
Um, you know, I have a, I have a platform, uh, not a huge platform, because I think I, I'm a little bit too old to be uh, super popular on, uh, you know, social media. Um, but however, I, I, what I try to do is I try to make people, especially on Twitter, I try to make people have open discussions and um, without name calling, without getting um, you know worked up and 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 crazy and and yelling at one another, I really try to sort of police that. But what I'd like to do is I like to ask questions um, that are not biased, you know, just questions, allowing people to to contribute from wherever they come from. However, I'm, you know, granted my followers are 85% male and, uh, and I don't know, you know, it's just, I, I, have, I have this platform that I like to have people have discussions without getting, um, uh, you know, without getting too biased, without, without getting too excited because I think we have, stopped listening to one another and have only started like taking in the information that we want to hear and spewing it out and and with a lot of oftentimes vitriol a lot of anger that comes with that you know um and i think that if we set examples of having open dialogue without getting flustered without getting you know angry at the other side or however other people think and just listen. I think it will help with all aspects, you know, not just our representation, not just, you know, with politics, but with everything. I think um, people just need to start listening more willingly to hear information from all sides. And I think that will start that conversation. I think it's really just an interesting and exciting time because it's a conversation that's evolving, which is really exciting. And throughout history, it's always the, the younger generations that are going to continue to change the world. And it's a very going to be a very different world as it continues to progress. And so even today, we're seeing more nuanced and interesting conversations, such as can we have a more representation of different body types, for example, right? Or, or even Kelly brought up the ageism in Hollywood. Like that is a conversation that we're hearing more and more, which is great. I, I think just having these discussions is really going to change it. And I think what has supercharged the change just the past few years has been social media, has been the the younger generation speaking out, and I, that's really what we need to continue to push. And I. I think I saw you had a question. Yes, in the front row. Um, that's a great session. I really enjoy everyone of your speech. Uh, I'm Dr. Helen Shi. I'm actually traveling from Houston, Texas. I'm actually bringing you a very important news and the story. And that is uh, our community actually right now is facing a huge challenge. That's called the New Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, we've been in the battlefield in Texas and also in Florida for this uh, new version of alien land laws. I don't know if some of you have heard a story about that. In fact, one of the really serious challenge we have is, although we are in this uh, battle of fighting discriminatory bills that banning immigrants from buying property and buying land, uh, agri especially agricultural land. I don't know if any one of you have you heard about the story about this. Uh, one of the uh, challenges we're really facing is how to bring the news out. This is a serious problem that really we're facing right now. It's a new version of Chinese Exclusion Act, alien land laws, but news reporters, you know, they don't want to report about the Chinese story, about Asian story. And our community tend to be in our own social media you know, in WeChat, WhatsApp, whatever. And so we don't have really enough advocates to bring the story out. So fortunately, we find an old uh, uh, mentor, really 
a very good mentor to work with us. We were able to bring some of the news out, but still that is really the challenge, really to let the mainstream community really understand what's going on, especially fighting with really China bashing. The mainstream media just love the story of China bashing. If you look at the stories, there are hardly any good news about China, any hardly good news in Asia. It's all about you know seeing China, seeing Asia as the new evil of access right now. And that's a really big challenge for us. So in fact, through this uh, really uh, great mentor we're working on, uh, she actually trying to establish uh, called the uh, media extreme uh, media emergency strike team to help the Asian American media team and really on the entertainment side too to work together to help us to form really the, how to respond this actively proactively rather than we always been you know pushed on um, bullied on and then we had to react to all of this so I really want to welcome your comment on that as well I have one resource for you and it may have been similar to what you were going to say but the Asian American Journalist Association AAJA is an organization you should partner with most of the individuals in that organization work at mainstream media companies and so there's a particular interest for them um, in terms of their own community. And so perhaps reaching out to, to that organization would be something that your group can do, maybe your mentor that's helping you out. Yeah, I was just gonna second that. I'm actually on uh, the board in DC. So we do have a number of reporters who are always constantly looking for these types of stories. And this is with print, this is with broadcast, this is with podcasts. Uh, and radio, so if you haven't already, you should reach out uh, to the board, and that goes for boards across the nation. You know, if you're in Texas, reach out to that local, you know, board. They're, they're everywhere. We're everywhere. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think that brings us to time. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to APAX. Of course, thank you so much again to our wonderful panelists. Thank you all for being here today, and please join me in giving them a warm round of applause. <laughs>